Good evening. Welcome to Living Arts. I'm your host, Jackie Suarez. Thank you for tuning in. As usual, I'm very excited about my next guest. Her name is Clarabel Ortega. She's the author of The Skin Walker's Apprentice, and she's here tonight. How are you? I'm good, Jackie. How are you? I'm delighted to have you here. You know, I was reading The Examiner, and I read about your book and, you know, you being a local author, and I was just really excited to get you on the show. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. So, um, You've, you're fairly young to be how you know be published already, so you know we want to find out all about that. Okay. So where did you like go to school? How'd you get your start? Um, I went to SUNY Purchase and I actually studied journalism there. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote for the school newspaper and for the independent newspaper, which was a student-run mm -hmm. um, newspaper, and I just really loved it. I loved writing. I loved um, talking to people in the community and the school. Mm -hmm. And after I graduated, I worked at the River Towns Enterprise newspaper, which okay. is in the River Towns, like Hastings, Irvington. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not too familiar with them. So what what do they do exactly? The River Town Enterprise. Um, mm -hmm. It's just a local paper. They just um, is it like the Penny Saver? Yeah, except for the ads and all that. It's just like a straight news um, print paper, mm -hmm. and they do you know. Board of Ed meetings and local crime and all that fun stuff. Oh, okay. So it's like the, what the patch is now online. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So when you finished doing that, um, at, at what point did you decide that you wanted to write this book? Um, well, after I worked as a reporter, I was working at Creative Artist Agency in the city, and I took a lot of long train rides into mm -hmm. the city and home because I was living in Peekskill at the time. Okay. And while I was on the train one day, I just kind of came up with the idea of, you know, a story about witches in New York City. I just kind of started scribbling about it on the subway. Mm -hmm. And it just snowballed from there. I kept um, writing different scenes. And then I decided to do research on it and see if there were any kind of witch stories in history connected to New York City. And I found so many really interesting things that I decided that I wanted to write, not just a book, but an entire series based on it. Okay, now you mentioned um, in, in some of the things I've, I've read about you that you're kind of a fan of Lord of the Rings and things like that. So who, yeah. who are some of like your influences as far as? Um, well, definitely um, I would say uh, J.K. Rowling is a big influence for me. Harry oh, Potter. Oh, the Harry Potter? Yeah, I, I really love her style of writing. It's so simple, yet it captured so many people's imaginations and attention for such a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, yeah, uh, J.R. Tolkien, the the writer of the Lord of the Rings mm -hmm. uh, trilogy. And I also love C.S. Lewis. Mm -hmm. um, I love all his stuff. And Kurt Vonnegut, who is not really the same genre, but he's my favorite author. And I just love him. And he really pushed me to want to write my own things and kind of make people think. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like the one person that kind of inspired you. Yeah. Not the one person, but... He's kind of kicked he, it off. He's been the biggest influence. I mean, he made me feel like I could actually write, even though I don't think I could ever write anything like <laughs> him because his, I don't know if you've ever read any of Kurt Vonnegut's books, but uh -huh. they, they really make you think. And it's kind of like you read one of his books and you're depressed, but then also really happy at the same time. Mm -hmm. And he was just really inspired me to, for a book to make you feel so many emotions. It was just really eye-opening for me. His imagination is really out there too. Yeah, so totally. it's rare yeah. that you kind of find that. Yeah. So now the whole process of this book has really been fascinating to me because uh, why don't you just give our audience, uh, you know, kind of the breakdown on how this whole thing unfolded. Well, I did research for mm, a little over six months before I even wrote anything. Um, and then I started book one, which is called um, The Riddle of the Timekeeper. Mm -hmm. And I was so writing... So this one is actually... A prequel. It's, okay. it's not part of the trilogy. It's part of the trilogy in that it's a prequel to it, but it's not any of the three books. Um, I was writing book one for a few months and I got stuck, kind of hit a wall, and I decided that I wanted to kind of flesh out a lot of the backstory and that mm -hmm. became the prequel of Skinwalker's Apprentice. And it's a lot of the reasons why the action and the conflict takes place in the trilogy um, mm -hmm. stems from this book mm -hmm. and I just kind of fell in love even more with the characters through it mm -hmm. and I'm really glad I did it because I think that especially when people read book one to be able to go back and read kind of the origins of where everyone came from and how everything got started will be mm -hmm. really interesting for them. You know what I, you know, I equate this to because I'm a big fan of like Star Wars Mm. I really liked how they did like the first three yeah. and then you know years later they went back and it was just nice to see like 
Anakin Skywalker as a kid mm -hmm. and how he all, you know, the whole thing got started. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, yeah, so it give people kind of like a real chance to kind of know the characters. Yeah, and there's so, there's so much that goes into the story. I can't, there's so much I can't say, but there's so much that goes into the story that... Well, give the audience a kind of an overview of what it's about. Sure. Well, um, the, the main character of The Skinwalker's Apprentice, there's two main characters. It's Margot Pennyfeather and Emerald Kip. And they're both 16-year-old witches living in completely different times. Um, Margot lives in the 1600s in East Hampton, Long Island, and Emerald is living in the 1980s in New York City. Mm -hmm. um, so we kind of follow both of their narratives throughout the book. Um, and Margot's kind of take takes place a little bit more when the, where the action starts, whereas Emerald, you just kind of get to know her on a more emotional um, level, but she's the main character of the trilogy. Um, Emerald Kip. Emerald Kip, yeah. And all the names that I took are from actual New York residents who, you know, I mixed and matched names, but uh, from the archives of obituaries from the New York Public Library. So wow. all names are like, are, are real names. And um, Did you find that there were any real live witches living in the city? Well, um, I mean, besides, <laughs> besides some people I know. Um. <laughs> well, G Goody Garlic, actually, um, she is a very important um, character in this book, in The Skinwalker's Apprentice. And she was a 50-year-old nursemaid who lived on East Hampton, Long Island. Mm -hmm. And she was accused of witchcraft 35 years before the Salem witch trials even happened. Wow. And a lot of people don't really know that story. Um, mm -hmm. So she's, she's a very important part of this story. And um, there's another character named Henrietta Snowden who lived in the 1800s. She shows up in the trilogy, but she was actually called the Witch of East Broadway. And um, she was very unusual. She was over six feet tall and very skinny. And she had an apartment full of animals and she actually got locked away in a mental asylum. Um, so she's a, she's a huge, huge part of the books as well, but she doesn't come till later on. Mm -hmm. So this is interesting how you get kind of picked up on just the history of the whole, you know, I find that this is everyone, everything now is about kind of witches and vampires and people that can change, you know, sh shape shifters and all this. So it's like, this is very timely. Right, and, and I think that that's what kind of makes the series stand out from the others is that mm -hmm. there are actual, you know, real residents of New York behind it and real history weaved within the story about magic. Mm -hmm. I think that makes it really interesting and compelling for people, and it's kind of like it could have happened almost. <laughs> so, no, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, do, would, would most people know that from, you know, just the, the cover of this, you know, somewhere on in the book, do you tell people that? This um, is loosely based on some of the history of New York. I have it on my website. I don't mm -hmm. include it in the book, but I'm hoping to, you know, spread the word about that later on, especially when book one comes out, um, mm -hmm. make that information a little bit more readily available to everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So book one is the Riddle of the Timekeeper. Emerald Kip and the Riddle of the Timekeeper. So yes. that's not quite finished yet. No, that comes out in the fall. It's um, it's going to be out on Winslet Press, which is a small um, publishing company mm -hmm. in Pennsylvania. Okay. And um, it's basically the story of Emerald Kip. She is on her last day of high school and her friends and family start to disappear. And she finds out that the only way to find them again is to solve the riddle of the timekeeper, which is a 300 year old riddle. And through that riddle, we find out how Emerald and Margot from The Skinwalker's Apprentice are connected. Okay. Yeah, and the timekeeper was actually based on a real person as well named John Voda, who was this uh, under five foot man who used to stand on the corner on Washington Square Park and kind of yell the time at NYU students so they wouldn't be late to class. He's, uh, he's a big character and um, he actually passed away two years ago. Oh wow. Uh, he, um, he's also um, a central part of the story and his, his character was based on a real person as well. Well, so um, just give it, you know, the, these are, well, the first one, I guess, um, The Skinwalker's Apprentice has been self-published. Yes. So tell our audience that whole process and, and what, what you did. For the self-publishing? Right. Um, well, I found out, um, I tried to research what would be the best uh, outlet for me to publish the book. Mm -hmm. um, I found Smashwords, which is a self-publishing um, company online, which is free. You basically format an ebook and you upload it and they upload it um onto apple barnes and noble um amazon you know mm -hmm. all, any website that you could sell an ebook on it's called smash books smash words smash called. words okay and then they take a percentage of 
each sale, but it's it's fairly easy and it was um, it was easy for me to do and it was it's a really a good website and it's a good resource for people who want to self publish. Mm -hmm. um, I went through uh, another website called Guru.com to actually find an editor for the book. And then I did research on another site called DeviantArt to find my cover artist. So basically everyone who worked on the book was just kind of like from the online community. Mm -hmm. um, but it, they were all really great people. And mm -hmm. um, they really all helped me a lot. And I keep in touch with them and they support my book and you know tweet links to it on their social media. Mm -hmm. um, so I did everything myself pretty much. Um, and then just a lot of marketing, a lot of you know, making graphics and posting that online, doing raffles on Facebook through Rafflecopter, which is another really great um, resource for authors if they want to do book giveaways, and it's free as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you actually do book marketing now? Um, yeah, I work at um, the Combined Book Exhibit, which is a marketing company in Buchanan, New York, and um, we display books at book fairs and shows um, worldwide. Is it just fiction or is it like textbooks or? Anything, it's any kind of book anyone could submit. Um, mm -hmm. Self-published, we work with you know the big publishing companies as well and eBooks, um, we work with eBooks as well. So explain that to me as well because you know I'm not all that familiar with it. Um, could you just have an eBook and, and not have a, a hard copy of your book? Sure, um, you can have an eBook. I think that's the most e economical way to go about it because you don't have to get any books printed. Um, so for somebody who's on a really tight budget but wants to publish their book, I would say an ebook only um, path is probably the best way to go, especially if you're going to make your ebook kind of um, an, on the affordable end, like 99 cents, or if you want to do a free book to drum up publicity um, for another book or for just you as an author. Mm -hmm. um, and then a, a good resource for print books is Create Space. I don't know if you've heard of that before. Yeah. Um, it's it's an Amazon company and it's print on demand, and it's the same thing, the same idea. You so you pre-order. Yeah, you 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 order the books, but you only pay for what you order, and then if you if somebody buys the book, they get a percentage of that, but you're not paying anything up front. So it's a really good resource again for um, people who don't have a publisher backing them. The way that I um, I looked at your website and some of the things that you you'd put on there, you've done a fabulous job of marketing this book. Thank you very much. So why don't you explain to our audience, you know, kind of what went into that as well? Well, I made sure that I had as many social media sites as I could. I have a Twitter, I have an Instagram, I have uh, an official blog, a Tumblr, just any social media site. It doesn't matter how big or small. My name is there. If you want to look me up, I'm going to be on there. Right, you've got high visibility yeah. online. And then. It's a matter of building your platform once you're on those websites. So I did something um, called a blog tour, okay. which is basically like a book tour at stores, but it's online. And through that blog tour, there was a raffle to win signed copies of my book and a, and a prize pack. And people had to like my social media pages in order to enter. So that was a really big help. And then I just kind of try to stay engaged with the community, like on Twitter. I participate on um, this thing called YA Lit Chat, which is basically one night a week you talk about um, issues pertaining to YA books on Twitter and you get to meet a lot of other auth authors and people in the industry through that. Um, and I d tried to do that with every site as much as I could and kind of not just have the site sitting there, but engage and meet people and be really active on it and know what was going on so that if somebody likes my Facebook page, it's not just like a page that's not giving them not, any you, benefit. You're interacting with them. Right, exactly. So if they write you a message, you write them back. Absolutely. I talk to everybody and I try to help authors that are kind of not knowing what they're doing or just starting out. Mm -hmm. um, because I think it's important for authors to stick together and to help one another. And just try to engage with readers and see what is on their radar and what they want to read and what's interesting to them. Because I'm still in the process of writing, so I can still incorporate that in my books. Yeah. Um, but I just try to stay as engaged as possible. I think it's really important. There's a lot of writers out there. There's a lot of self-published writers. So you have to try to kind of stand above the fray. Right, and kind of distinguish yourself. Yeah. So how's um, the reception to the book been? I would think it'd be you know really good. It's been really good. I um, actually, the week of release, I, I reached the top 
100 on Amazon um, for my genre. So that was really good. Thank you. Um, and I've had steady sales since it was released February 24th, which is actually my birthday. And um, <laughs> so it's been really good. I've been really lucky and I'm really happy that people have taken an interest in my story. Mm -hmm. There's nothing more that I could ask for, really. So what is the next step? You said that you have a publisher. Yes. So how did that happen? Well, I actually participated in a Twitter pitch party um, called PitMad, and if you're not familiar with no. what that is, <laughs> um, it's kind of like the new age of pitching and trying to get a publisher. Pitching through. your ideas. Right. Okay. So it's one designated day where um, you will pitch your story in 140 characters or less, and there's agents and publishers and editors on Twitter actively searching for the hashtag that's associated with the event. So for this, for this um, event, it was PitMad. So I would put hashtag PitMad after all my tweets about my book. And if a publisher liked my pitch, they would favorite it, which meant that I would then send them my manuscript. And through that process, I was able to get a publishing contract with um, my current publisher. Well, good for you. Thank you. This is all new to me, to be quite honest with you. You know, but I'm not a writer. Well, it's but it's really interesting. I mean, there's a there's a lot going on. Yeah, it's a changing world. I mean, self publishing is growing, and mm -hmm. people who were told no for a really long time aren't having the option to, you know, to do what they want and write and put their work out there. And there's a lot of really good books to be read. And I think the stigma that goes along with self-publishing is like slowly dwindling away because people yeah. are really putting a lot of effort into the quality of the product and like I said you can get an editor you can get a, a mm -hmm. cover designer for your book you don't have to be a part of a publishing house anymore mm -hmm. so I think it's a good time to be a writer so you mentioned that the person that designed this book lives in Norway yeah her name is Susan Van Pelt and she's actually an amazing artist she mm -hmm. does 3d um, art um, digital art through Photoshop she's been featured in a lot of magazines and um, articles online and I found her actually on DeviantArt which is an art website mm -hmm. and I asked her if she would like to work on my book cover and she's just been really great. So did you have an idea of what you wanted it to look like? Absolutely. I had did an idea. Did you kind of do like a little sketch and she kind of <laughs> filled it in for no, you? No, I can't draw at all. <laughs> um, I told her the vision that I wanted which was I wanted Emerald who is the girl on the cover with the pink hair. I wanted her to be center because this, the book is really about her at the end of the day. And I in, in the background, there's a girl floating on an umbrella. And that's actually Margot Pennyfeather. When you read the, the whole book, you, you realize why that comes mm -hmm. into play. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it incorporates both parts of the story. And Margot is you know the background. She's the history. Mm -hmm. um, but she's very important as well. And she's very central to the story. Absolutely, because that's a, that's a wonderful cover. Thank I was really. You. It just, you know, it's it's striking. Thank you. I, I wanted something that was going to capture people's attention, and I wanted the character to kind of look a little weird because she is a witch, and <laughs> she shouldn't just look like, you know, a normal pretty girl. She should look kind of interesting and different. So did you have a sense of, I mean, this was something that was interesting to you, but did you want to market this towards a particular group? Well, it's a YA book, so um, it's a lower grade YA book so it's for 13 to 15 year olds if you go on Amazon that's what it's categorized as mm -hmm. but I think that it's also really it could be for anybody especially since it's set in the 1980s I know people my mm -hmm. age I'm 30 I would love to read a book like that if I hadn't written it there's a lot of music incorporated and cultural references to the 80s and mm -hmm. I think um, it could definitely be something that's interesting to older and uh, younger crowds, but it's it's marketed towards um, the YA crowd, absolutely. So um, I guess moving forward, did you want to see if this could be used as something in, in schools or something? Well, I'm, I'm going on a f couple of uh, library visits over the summer um, mm -hmm. to different libraries and speaking with kids and doing worksheets with them because there's there is so much history behind the mm -hmm. book that it's something that you know librarians and teachers can use as a teaching tool especially for kids who have a hard time concentrating on that kind of thing mm -hmm. I think that because there's kind of like a magical fun story behind it uh -huh. also weaved in with the history it could be definitely a very powerful tool for that so now well is this pretty much how you learned about this through your job uh, marketing you mean yeah. or I mean, I, I mean, just the self-publishing part of it, because it seems like it was very involved, or did you just kind of... I kind of taught myself, to be honest with you, because I, 
I've only been working at this um, at the combined book exhibit for a few months um, so I just learned by going online talking to other authors and kind of thinking of things myself what would I, what would appeal to me if I was a reader um, what would catch my attention because I am a big reader I love books and mm -hmm. I kind of tried to look at it through the eyes of a reader and that's what really helped me to to know what to do and to um, think of new ideas and how to get exposure for my book mm -hmm. and also I used to be a reporter so I kind of mm -hmm. know how to reach out to media I'm not afraid to call people and kind of just like put myself out there mm -hmm. what were some of the best parts about being a reporter for you um, just being involved in a community I really loved knowing like all the mayors and talking to them and finding out what was going on and helping to keep people informed and when there was something you know shady or sketchy going on <laughs> I liked being able to uncover that and to just keep the community abreast of what was going on and um, both good and bad yep so what would be next for you moving forward I mean do you see this kind of do you see this maybe even being produced for a film um, I'm actually in talks with a production company. Why am I not surprised? <laughs> <laughs> for uh, po that, for that's a possibility, especially mm -hmm. because of my old job at a creative artist agency. I, I do have a lot of um, connections in Out that. Out in LA? Um, they're in LA. They're based in LA, but mm -hmm. I worked in the New York City office. Um, okay. So I met a lot of really great people there, and um, there are some people interested in um, making it into a screenplay, um, but that's later on down the line. Right now I'm concentrating on finishing up book one so I can release it hopefully near Halloween of this year. All right, it's kind of co coincide with all the yeah. <laughs> witches and the goblins. So there's a third part. You have a, a third book in the trilogy. So why don't you tell our audience about that one as well? Uh, the third book? Mm -hmm. um, well, there's actually, this is a prequel, and mm -hmm. then there's three books. The first book is um, Emerald Kip and the Riddle of the Timekeeper, and then the other two books are actually as of yet untitled. Mm -hmm. um, but they all follow the same narrative. It's all about Emerald and her kind of trying to solve this mystery. Um, but books two and three are kind of way in the future right Way in now. the future. <laughs> yeah. So is one of these characters in this book you? Um... I would say there's a little bit of me in all of the characters in the book as opposed to me being just one. Mm -hmm. um, especially one of the most important narratives of the trilogy is people who are misunderstood, people who are kind of um, cast out. Emerald definitely plays that role, so does Margot because she's extremely poor. Emerald's different, you know, and not only because she's a witch but because she misbehaves all the time. She mm -hmm. acts out so she doesn't fit in. Um, I've definitely been through that and I think almost everybody has felt misunderstood at some point in their life. Um, so that's the main theme behind it. People are, who are underestimated but who have a lot to them and who, ha who can do more than what other people believe of them, you mm -hmm. know. Um, so that's definitely a, a huge theme and it's actually dedicated to my brother who kind of went through that his whole life and... Um, kind of bullied. Not bullied but kind of Always with good intentions mm -hmm. and not it not working out in his favor. But I think that there's something to be said of people who are kind of kicked down their whole life and who are resilient and keep trying to stand up and keep fighting for what they believe in. I think those are the best kind of people. The best kind of characters. Yeah, absolutely, because you can identify with them. If people who are characters who are real, who have struggles, who aren't just perfect and can do everything, but who have a lot of levels to them and who are black and white and who are one moment you can root for them and the next moment you're incredibly angry at them. That That's what makes a character, I think, really interesting when they feel human because you know, humans are imperfect and we have our ups and our downs. And I really try to reflect that in all of the characters in my book. So I thought when I, when I was reading some of the book that Margot was kind of like the, the bad witch. Really? Yes. I've never heard that before. <laughs> yeah. No. For she, some reason. She she's she's definitely not bad. She's she's very good and she's a she runs her life runs a parallel to Emerald's. Um mm -hmm. and at the very end of the Skinwalker's Apprentice you find out kind of a hint of what that is and um the whole trilogy is centered around the magic of time travel and being able to control time. Mm -hmm. So um it's something that ties them together. So you mentioned that you were having a little bit of writer's block with the Riddle of a Timekeeper. Yes. So what's the process like for you? Um, I mean, you have a full-time job yes. and you know you have other things that are going on. Right. So what's, um, 
I try to write um, in the afternoons after work. I like going to coffee shops. Um, when I'm at home, it's a little harder for me to mm -hmm. concentrate. Um, I love going into the city and writing on site since most of the book takes place in New York City. Mm -hmm. um, Which are some of the sites that you go to? Um, the New York Public Library is a big one. Um, mm -hmm. Roosevelt Island I've been to because a big part of um, book one takes place there. Isn't there like a mental institution there? There used to be. It's actually apartments now. But that's okay. the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It yeah. used to it used to be Blackwell's Island, and that's where Henrietta Snowden, who I mentioned before, that's where she was incarcerated. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But it's a beautiful, like lavish apartment now, which you're not allowed to take pictures in or anything. But I still it's not. Why, why can't you take pictures? Um, I guess because it's kind of like a high end apartment. There's like a concierge there or whatever, and a doorman, and he's oh, okay. the, yeah. He but does it still look like a mental institution or? Well, part of it there's kind of like a dome part, which is the center, which was that part was from the original hospital and then they expanded it for the apartments mm -hmm. and um, that's kind of like sleek and new mm -hmm. um, but I don't know I guess the residents won't be happy about people taking pictures of their I apartments. Know, right? Just because, but there was a lot of crazy things that went on there though. Yeah it's supposedly super haunted and yeah, um, really sad too. Yeah but um but it's a really interesting, beautiful place, and I recommend going there for anybody, you know, just mm -hmm. taking a look while I'm walking um, around the island. I, I did it, and, and it's really, it's... it's kind of a, it inspires you to write? Yeah, I actually also went to Salem um, and oh, took really? a trip there to do a lot of research and did a lot of the witch tours and the museums and got a, little, a lot of inspiration from that. So is it safe to say that you're kind of like a witch expert now? <laughs> Not yet. I'm on my way. Maybe like a junior witch expert. <laughs> what would you even call that? There must be a word for it, like a I'm witchologist. <laughs> Probably. I'm not sure. <laughs> so um, we're kind of winding down the interview. I want um, to just find out, like, what's next for you? What? Um... Well, um, for right now, I'm just, you know, busy promoting the Skinwalker's Apprentice. Um, Where will you be next that anybody can go or... Um, I don't have any events planned right now. I do have a, a few library visits um, lined up over the summer and a few pending school visits as well. I'm hoping to do another author signing soon. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's right. You were at the Hudson Valley um, Gateway Experience over the weekend. How yeah. was that? It was great. It was really, really good. There was a lot of people, um, mm -hmm. great turnout. Mm -hmm. It was wonderful. And um, so for now, I'm just uh, working on that and finishing uh, book one so that I can have it released in the fall, hopefully. And be on schedule with it? Yes. <laughs> so um, you want to tell, I guess, everyone how they can reach you and various ways that they can interact with you sure. about the book? Sure. Well, um, my website is just my name, uh, clarabelortega.com. They can go there to find out any information, read the synopsis, buy the book. Um, and then my uh, email address is clarabelortegaauthor at gmail.com. Anybody can feel free to email me. And um, my Twitter is Clarabel underscore Ortega. Um, so any of those venues, or I have a, a lot more. If they go to my website, they can find all of them. Okay, because you, you can be contacted pretty much any way yes. in the world. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then, of course, this is available on Amazon. On Amazon, Barnes & Noble, um, iTunes, iBookstore, and um, Smashwords as well. This has been one of the best interviews I've ever had. Thank, um, thank you so you much, for coming. Becky, for I really appreciate me. it. <laughs> Um, all right, so the Living Arts community, thank you for tuning in. This has been a really great show. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, definitely support Clarabelle. And um, don't forget to like us on Facebook and visit our website and to tune in. Oh, and go to YouTube as well. So thank you. Peace. Talk to you soon. Mm -hmm.